We now shift gears and begin a new unit in which we're going to discuss reactions that form carbon-carbon bonds. So formation of a carbon-carbon bond is a major way that chemists build large and complex molecules from smaller building blocks, and it's also a major way that nature builds large and complex molecules from smaller building blocks. So let's go back and think about the reactions that we've studied so far. Basically, in all of the reactions that we've studied, a bond has been formed between a nucleophilic atom, something with a lone pair on it, so nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, sulfur, a halogen, and an electrophilic carbon of some sort. So to form a carbon-carbon bond, we have to react a nucleophilic carbon atom with an electrophilic carbon. So first, I just want to review what I mean when I'm talking about electrophilic carbons. The first electrophilic carbons that we met were alkyl halides. And then subsequently, we've also met mesylates and tosylates. And in biochemistry, you use phosphates of some sort. What ties all of these structures together is they have a carbon atom that contains a leading However, the most important class of carbon electrophiles is actually probably the carbonyl group. We've already looked a little bit about at the chemistry of carbonyl groups. So a nucleophile attacks the carbonyl carbon, and that breaks the CO pi bond. That ends up breaking that bond so as to put the electrons in the pi bond onto the more electronegative oxygen atom. And the reason why carbonyls are better electrophiles than alkyl halides is because when you're breaking a bond upon nucleophilic attack, a weaker pi bond is broken rather than a sigma bond. Whenever you have a leaving group leaving, you're breaking a sigma bond. Carbonyl addition, you're just breaking a pi bond. And then, of course, carbonyl additions are usually followed up by some sort of protonation of the negatively charged oxygen to give a neutral alcohol as the final product. So having looked at carbon electrophiles, I would now like us to look at carbon nucleophiles. So any carbon atom with a lone pair can act as a nucleophile. Well, have we seen any of those? To begin with, I want to say that all carbon atoms with lone pairs have to have a negative charge on them. And we have already looked at several examples, the cyanide ion, Cn minus. We've looked at the alkyne anion. We've looked at the enolate, in which you have a minus charge on a carbon next to a carbonyl. I call this one the simple enolate. And then there's also what I like to call the double enolate, where you have a minus charge on a carbon that is between two carbonyls. So in all four of these cases, the minus charge is somehow stabilized. So in the case of cyanide and the alkyne anion, the minus charge is stabilized by being on an sp hybridized carbon and therefore being in an orbital that is closer to the positively charged nucleus. In the case of the enolates, what stabilizes the minus charge is resonance. Okay, there's another resonance structure where you can put the negative charge onto the oxygen. And in the case of the double enolate, there are two resonance structures where you can put the negative charge onto each of the two oxygens. So having said that carbonyl groups are the most important carbon electrophiles, what I would like to focus us in now on is the reaction of carbon nucleophiles with carbonyl groups. So the first example I want to consider is the use of cyanide as the nucleophile, and that forms a functional group called a cyanohydrate where you have a carbon, previously the carbonyl carbon, containing both a CN and an OH. Okay, so the first example here is with acetone. So first we treat it with sodium cyanide, and then 
after protonation, we end up with the cyanohydrin with two methyl groups on the central carbon. We can also use an aldehyde as a starting material, and that now is going to give us a cyanohydrin with just one substituent on the carbon containing the CN and the OH. So incidentally, you probably are aware of the fact that cyanide is poisonous. And the reason why cyanide is poisonous is because it is such a good nucleophile and it can attack carbonyl groups very readily to undergo this reaction. A similar reaction takes place with the alkyne anion, except instead of CN minus coming in, it's C triple bond C minus coming in. Otherwise, you form a structure that is completely analogous. So you have the carbon that was previously the carbonyl carbon now containing an alkyne group on it and an OH group on it. Although those reactions are important, they are not all that general in that you are only working with functional groups that contain triple bonds. Now, those triply bonded functional groups can be reacted further to do something with them. For example, nitriles can get reduced or hydrolyzed. Alkynes can get reduced. But a more general class of carbon-carbon bond forming reactions is when you use the enolate as the carbon nucleophile. So the reaction of a simple enolate with an aldehyde or ketone is called the aldol condensation. That's because the product is a beta hydroxy ketone in this case, which is also, as we will see in a subsequent lesson, referred to as an aldol. The aldol condensation is a very important reaction, and we're going to spend several lessons in this unit discussing the aldol condensation. You can do a similar reaction with a double enolate. You can add that central carbon with the negative charge on it to an aldehyde and you get a structure as shown. In both of these structures, the new carbon-carbon bond that's being formed in this reaction is shown in red. Then another variation on this theme is when we take an enolate and add it to an ester instead of adding it to an aldehyde or a ketone. This also has a name. This is called the Claisen condensation. The Claisen condensation is named after Ludwig Claisen, who first discovered it. And there are two variations on the Claisen condensation that you need to be aware of. So for the first one is when we use what I call a ketone enolate. So that's an enolate where the minus charge is on the carbon alpha to a ketone, and we add it to the ester. The product of this now is a beta diketone. The ester piece goes away completely. Once again, the new carbon-carbon bond is shown in red, the ester fragment is shown in black, and the ketone enolate fragment is shown in blue. The second example is where we actually take an enolate that is formed from an ester. It's called an ester enolate, so the minus charge is on the carbon alpha to an ester rather than alpha to a ketone. And the final product of this reaction is a beta keto ester. And in a beta keto ester, the new carbon-carbon bond that's formed is still in red, but now the blue piece that came from an ester enolate is still an ester rather than a ketone. The piece that came from the ester that gets attacked, shown in black, is the keto part of this. Okay, so that's the broad overview of carbon-carbon bond forming reactions, obviously focusing on enolates plus carbonyls. In the next video, we're going to talk a little bit about how enolates are generated, and we're going to talk about a molecule that you can get out of enolates, which is called an enol.